privilege for Jan and I to join you today. And uh, as I mentioned last week, we're going to look today at seven, what I call seven principles in hearing God's voice. And we talked a little bit last week about how important um, our thinking is and our thought life is a critical component uh, to us in our walk with God. And uh, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians that talks about how though the outward man perishes, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed it or not, but we're, we're slowly dying. You know, we're getting older. Uh, our bodies, are, you know, I notice more. Uh, science tells us that your immune system peaks out in terms of its efficiency right around the year when you're right around 18 years old. That's your, isn't that good news? You like that? You like that? It peaks out around uh, when you're 18. And after that, now, obviously, if you're here today and you're 19, 20, 21, whatever, I mean, you're just you're kind of, you're maybe a little bit over the edge, but you're still up there. And you see, as time goes on, your immune system breaks down, and our bodies break down. We, I, we, we, we notice that, we feel that. It becomes a little more exaggerated, a little more noticeable. Maybe you get in your 40s, and then you really begin to notice it when you're in your 50s, and I can't attest for later on, but I've heard people say once you get a past your 50s, that it, uh, it even goes a little more rapidly. But you know what? Uh, even though our body is getting older, it's just a part of the curse. You know, doesn't wake up. God, you know, God created Adam and Eve. They were created to live forever. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve were supposed to live forever. The Bible says that death entered by sin. If they hadn't sinned, they'd still be living today on earth because God, everything God did was perfect. It was just, they would be still living today. But because of sin, it allowed death to come in. But one thing, now we can slow down uh, the aging of our bodies. There are certain things we can do. We can take care of ourselves. We can eat more healthy. We can exercise. We can slow it down. We can't stop it. I mean, there's just nobody on earth today. Probably the oldest person on earth is maybe 120. It's kind of interesting how God said something about that in Genesis, that he would put the limit on man at 120. I was talking to a medical doctor years ago. who was not a believer. And he talked about how we should live to be 120. And I said, well, that's interesting. The Bible actually says that. He goes, it does? I said, yeah, read Genesis. It talks about that. But you know what? What doesn't have to get old is our thinking. We can, we, can, we, can, we can address that. We can stop getting old in our thinking. We can continue to renew our mind with God's Word. And you know, one of the symptoms of getting old thinking-wise is when I begin to think more about my past than I do about my future. I begin to think, I can remember back when, and there's nothing wrong with having good memories. Thank God for memories that we have. And, and I was talking today about the family reunions. Those are all great. And there's, there's, we can treasure those memories. But when I begin to live there, when I begin to say, well, today isn't as good as, you know, I can remember back then, the good old days. You know what? If I'm walking with God, today should be better than any other time in my life. Amen. Because it gets better and better. Though the outward man perishes, the inward man but I have to renew my inner, inward man with the Word of God. It doesn't happen automatically. If I go to default, I'll think old. I'll begin to, boy, you know, I wish I would have done that. I wish I hadn't done that. Or, uh, you know, why can't it be like it used to be? You know, why can't cars be like the, you know, the good old days? They never, you know, they just, no, they didn't. They broke down all the time. I mean, there was problems with cars. I mean, it's just, you know, our, our thinking, you know, we think, we tend to, you know, glor you know, glor by the past and think it was always better than it wasn't. There was always there was problems. But you and I, we don't have to get old in our thinking. We can address that. And I also mentioned last week the story about uh, me being a, a child in, in elementary school. The older uh, students that were, were, they were uh, deaf students, and uh, the fact that they, they're, they're, they're talking, they talk loud, and it kind of frightened me as a, as a young person because they couldn't hear well. You know, they couldn't, they, they just couldn't, they were being taught and trained some, some techniques to, to do, but when you, when you don't hear well, you don't speak right. Hmm. And a lot of times we as believers, we don't talk right because I'm not listening to my Heavenly Father. You know, I'm talking like everyone around me. You know, I have relatives in my family that, that they grew up in the South, and if they were up here talking to me, they would have a whole different accent and lingo than I do. Because we tend to pick up things from people around us, don't the culture around us affects. And you know, we have a certain dialect here living in central Ohio that's a whole lot different than New York. Have you ever been to New York City? Have you ever been to the Bronx? I have. They talk a lot different. Have you ever been down the deep south? They talk a whole lot different than we do because of the influence of people around them. 
who are you and I allowing to influence how I talk? Romans 10, 17, a very well-known verse. A lot of you guys know that. At least you'll know it when I say it. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So in other words, faith will come into our lives. But you know what? For the, for the majority of my, of my uh, walk with God, I've, I've misread that verse. I have read that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But really, if I was real honest, I read that faith comes by reading by reading the Word of God. It doesn't say that. We do need to read the Word of God. I'm a big proponent of God's Word. We need to read and study God's Bible. But I need to hear His voice. And when you look at that verse, faith comes by hearing. Notice it says faith comes by hearing and hearing. It isn't, well, I heard that once. You know, I know I went, I went to a lot of schooling, and boy, they did a lot of repetition in school. I learned the same things over because we don't always get it the first time. Things repetition. Same thing with spiritual. Spiritual things are really a lot like natural things. You learn by practice, and by rote, and by doing things over and over again. So faith comes by hearing and hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that word, word, it says Word of God. You look that up in the Bible of importance. There are two main words in the New Testament, two Greek words that are translated as word. One is logos. You probably heard that term. Logos means the written word. An expression of thought. You know, these words in here, this is logos. This is the written word of God. And the other Greek word is rhema. Rhema means the spoken word of God. When God speaks to us. Sometimes you're reading through the Bible, all of a sudden you're reading this verse, and all of a sudden it's like it's in bold print. It's like you know, God just begins to speak to you about that word. That's a rhema word of God. When God speaks a word into your life. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the spoken word. God needs to speak to us. We need to expect to hear from God, because God does speak to us. And Jesus said, whatever is in the abundance of my heart, my mouth is going to speak, so whatever I'm putting in my heart is what I'm going to talk about. So if I'm having a hearing problem, I'm going to have a speaking problem. Some of us, we talk negative, we talk doubt, and oh, it's never, I'm never going to be like it with... You know, we're, we're not listening to God's voice. He doesn't talk like that. And sometimes, as believers, when we talk about hearing, from the word, hearing the Word of God, we're so caught up looking for the spectacular that we miss the supernatural. You know, I'm looking for some big thing to happen. Remember the prophet God had? And there was a big earthquake, there was a big windstorm, and God said, He wasn't in any of those, and He spoke in a still, small voice. Because I'm looking for the spectacular. And all the time God is speaking supernaturally, I just don't recognize it. I haven't been recognizing it. I'll never forget, this is something happened to me probably 10, 12 years ago. I'm, and we're living in Boardman, Ohio. I was on staff at church in, in, in Youngstown. And I have three sons. One of my sons is up in the driveway. I don't remember which one it was. He's out washing the car because I had my kids. You know, they wash cars, they mow lawns, they learn how to do those type of things. And a lot of times I look at them and I'm like, oh, no, not the tires first. I told him, start at the top, and you just go back and correct. But anyways, he's out there washing the car, and, and I'm watching him, and I'm just looking out the window. It's a sunny day. He's out there washing the car, and I'm looking at my son. I'm thinking, you know what? I just love that kid. You know, it doesn't matter whether he does it right or wrong. He's just my son, and I just enjoy him. I just enjoy my son. I just treasure him. He doesn't have to do something great like he's my son. And I enjoy our relationship. And he has had to be a full-grown, mature man before I can. I can enjoy him right over, whatever, you know, if he's 12 years old, I can enjoy him as a 12-year-old. You know, when God enjoys us, you don't have to be a fully mature Christian for God to enjoy you. Mm. So I'm just looking out the window, and I'm just thinking, man, if that kid don't know as much as I love, I just love that kid. I just, man, I just, I just like watching him. And just, he's my son. I just enjoy watching him. So I'm looking out the window, I, just like today. I'm looking out the window, and I'm looking at my son, thinking those thoughts, how much I treasure him. I'm looking out the window, and all of a sudden, in my left ear, God says to me, that's how I look at you. Man, I almost want to cry right now, just like, God used that example, how much I love my son. He says, 
I love you just like that. It helped me, you know. It's like trying to understand how, how does this love of God work and how does he, how does he, you know, he's this great, awesome God, and, but he's a personal God and loves us. You know what? That's what he's saying to you today. There's my son. I love him. I treasure him. That's what he's saying to you today, man. He said, there's my daughter. I just, I get excited about her. I just love that daughter of mine. I just love that daughter of mine. I just love that son of mine right back there. That's what God's saying. That's the kind of God that you and I serve. He's a loving God. He's a personal God. He sees us right where we're at. And I don't have to do it perfectly. You don't have to do it perfectly. He already loves us. But those are the kind of things we need to hear. If you have any doubts about that, read Psalm 139. Once Psalm 139 says that God has more thoughts about you than the sands of the sea. You ever been to a beach? You ever see how many little grains of sand there are? How many beaches there are? How many oceans there are in the world? That's what God thinks. That's how much God thinks about you and I. And he's looking at you today. He treasures you today. He is an awesome God. The first verse we're going to look at today is kind of a foundational verse we talked about last week. John 10, 27. Jesus made a declaration about you and I as his children. And he said, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. There should be an expectancy on your part, on my part, that we can hear God. Jesus said, my sheep, if I'm a, if I'm a child of God, if I want to, he's my shepherd, I should, I should hear his voice. I know that he knows me, he knows you, and we can follow him. And there's nine different times, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, nine different times in those three Gospels where Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. A lot of times those were kind of they were, they were kind of a warning. Now he wasn't talking to a bunch of people that didn't have any ears. They all had ears. He's talking about with the heart. Are they hearing me with their heart? You know, when Jesus was talking about the end times in, in uh, Matthew uh, eleven fifteen, he was talking about how things are going to happen, and he said, "He who has ears to hear, let him hear." We need to be listening. I mean, there's things happening in our world today. You and I, more than ever, we need to hear what God is saying to us today, more than ever. More than ever. When you talked about the sower sows the word in that famous parable, that sower sows the word about the different types of soil, and you talked about every time they heard the word, but the enemy would came and stole from the from the hardened soil or the, the rocky soil. They heard, but the, the there wasn't much depth there. But each time he says, He who has ears to hear, <coughs> let him hear. We need to hear. You need to hear today what God is saying to you. Our next verse, we also mentioned last week that our thought life is critical to our walk with God. Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What are you thinking about today? What predominates your thought life? Is it the one talk kickoff today? Is it the craft show this afternoon, next week? Is it family we're having over dinner? Those are all good things. Nothing wrong with those things. But what are you thinking about most of what, what occupies your thoughts? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, we become what we think. We become what we think. That's why we have to renew our minds. Romans 12, 2. We talked, I think we talked, it was one of the, the songs we sang today. We have to renew our minds with the Word of God. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to renew our minds with God's Word. We need to learn, just like I talked about this morning about. We, we just have to tell ourselves, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to praise Him. It doesn't matter what things are going on, or things are not going on in my life, or how I feel. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to praise Him. We need to take that same control over our thought life. We need to control our thought life because my thoughts control my life. Your thoughts control your life. Because if you don't think it, guess what? You're not going to do it. You ever have somebody say to you, why didn't you do this or that? You go, I'm you know, you, you ever have that? You just, well, why didn't you do this? You know, I don't know. I just didn't think about it. I just didn't think about it. Our thoughts are powerful. Our thoughts and our beliefs shape our life. And if you believe something, even if it's not true, if you believe it, it's going to be true for you because you think that's truth. That's why we have to read God's Word. We have to study God's Word. Because all of us have a way of thinking. We were all brought up, and all of us have different family backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds. 
we were taught to think a certain way, and I've got to change that when I begin to serve God. Look at this, Proverbs 4, 23. I think this actually comes from the, uh, either the contemporary English or the, uh, the Living Bible. It says, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Your life is shaped. If you say, if you feel you're defeated, if you feel like you're a failure, if you feel like I can't get over this hump, this, what, what happened in my life, what didn't happen, you're probably not. Because your thoughts are powerful. Your brain is probably the most powerful chemical on earth. I mean, how many times people talk themselves into sickness and people talk themselves into problems? Our minds are powerful. You know, we're all, we're all without God's help, we're hopeless. We're gonna, you're going to be stuck in that rut. But God's word, is, the Bible says it's living and active, more powerful than, any, than, than anything. It's sharper than any, any sword. The word of God, by studying, reading, meditating, God's word. My mind and your mind is a battleground. There is a war going on. Even right now, some of you are trying to listen today and you're, you're kind of being there's, there's something going on. You know, maybe you've gone back to a memory of something that happened or didn't happen and it could be a bad memory. There's, there's, a, there's a tug of war right now. As you're sitting here today, there's a tug of war for you to keep focusing on God and His word. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a battle going on. Here's how it says in Romans 7 verses 22 and 23. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. War with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. You ever catch yourself saying, I said I wasn't going to say that anymore. I said I wasn't going to do that anymore. And there I go. I did it again. I said it again. There's a war going on. You know, I was watching little cartoons, you know, little cartoon, and there was a there's a little demon over here. There's a little angel over here. There's a, you ever remember as a kid watching those? I don't, know, I don't watch cartoons anymore, but I remember that was just always caught your attention. You know what? That's funny, but that's, that's a lot of truth there. There's a war going on for your thought life. And there's voices speaking into this ear and that ear. Remember, to, I just, God spoke into this ear about my son, about how he looks at me. There's a war going on for our thought life. There's a battle. You're precious. The devil hates you, I tell you, but he hates you because you and I are created in the image of God. Every time he sees us, he sees really a picture of God, and he knows what his future is going to be. So he hates you. Nothing personal, but he hates you. you know? <laughs> he hates everybody. He doesn't take mercy on a little baby. or No, he doesn't take mercy on anybody. We have to change our thought life. We have to get a hold of that battle. And what I do is by training my mind. I'm going to talk about how you feed that mind just a little bit. But our mind is the key to peace. An unmanaged mind leads to tension, pressure, stress. All those, we gravitate towards the negative without God's help. We become very fearful about the future. We become fearful about the present. We have to manage our minds. Romans 8, 6 says it this way. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Isaiah 26, 3, one of my favorite verses says, He, God, will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Him. But you know what? There's always there's this tug. My, my life and, and my emotions and my memories always want to pull me to, this, to the one side. God's trying to pull me to the other side. And you know what? You and I are going to lose every day if we're not spending time with God and spending time reading His Word, retraining our minds, retraining our thoughts. So three quick keys before we get into our story today, three quick keys to having a healthy thought life is we need, you and I need to focus, have three focuses. One is focus on the truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. Jesus is the truth. Truth is not an ideology, it's not a philosophy. Truth is a person. Jesus is the truth. Everything else you and I, things may look real, things may look right to our natural senses, but I'm telling you, Jesus is the barometer. He is the truth. No matter how strongly your feelings or emotions or other people are telling you all these things, it's Jesus. He is the truth. We need to keep our focus on Him, or we won't be able to do it. You and I, none of us are disciplined enough or strong enough to do it without His help. We need to focus. 
We need to feed on the truth, the truth of God's word. So we need to feed on the truth. We need to free our mind, free our mind with the truth. John 8, 31, or 8, 32, you shall know the truth. Jesus is the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Other than that, we're trying natural, you know, we're trying 12 steps, 20 steps. I mean, those are all good natural things, but if you look at the success rate, it's pretty dismal. Only God can bring deliverance. God will use some of those things to help people in the meantime and not put those things down. But I'm just saying, they'll, they're not going to deliver anybody. Jesus is the only one who can deliver you and I. Without him, we can't, we can't do it. We can be, I can try and be disciplined. So we need to feed on the truth. We need to free our mind by the truth. Because this world is so, internet is so negative, TV is so negative, the news is so negative. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're watching a lot of the news, you're, you're, that's why you're depressed today. <laughs> I guess to say, I watch Fox for 10 minutes and I'm depressed. I have to, okay, but well, what's on the Christian show? I got I just, I mean, I like to know what's going on, but just so much is so negative. Just, I get pessimistic. I get so negative, downcast, because I'm focusing on the, the wrong thing. Thirdly, we need to focus on the truth. Here's what Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. He says, until I get there, focus, focus on reading the scriptures. Focus on reading the scriptures. That needs to be our focus. So we need to feed on the truth. We need to free our mind with the truth. And we need to focus on the truth. One way to do that is focusing on God's word. Secondly, Philippians 2, 4. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others, too. I need to become more other people-minded. My natural tendency is to think, well, what about me? How's this going to affect me? How's this going to look to me? How's this going to help me? I mean, that's, we're all, I, I tell people when I do marriage counseling, you know what, you're going to find out, when you get married, you're going to find out how selfish you are. Amen. 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 Yeah. Well, we're, I'm inherently, I'll just say, if you guys look at it, I'm inherently selfish. And when you get married, you realize life is not all about you. It doesn't revolve about what you want. Your schedule. There's another person. Have God kids. It gets worse. How to share. God <laughs> doesn't teach you how to help other people. God doesn't teach you how to serve others. So we need to focus on the word. We need to focus on other people. Because I tend to focus. You know, when you give that offering. You're saying, hey, Lord, it's not all about me. And really, if, if you read the Bible, the time belongs to God. I can remember for a number of years, I used to pat myself on the back. I used to say, man, I'm a tither, God. I mean, I, I, I've got to be really up there with you because I'm a tither. And then I read the Bible and realized, as a believer, now if you're not serving God, you don't know God. He doesn't care about you, man. He wants your heart. He wants you. But as a believer, the Bible says the tithe belongs to God. It's not even, it's not even mine. I'm acknowledging that I'm a steward, that I'm a manager, that he's Lord of heaven and earth. Today could be my last day. If he, if he said, you're done, you're done. The tithe declares that, he, that it's his. It's, I'm giving back what's his. It makes me recognize all I have is his. He's giving me my job, my income. Without him, I have nothing. Nothing of eternal value. It's only when I get to begin to give offerings. I go, but because the tithe belongs to him. But when we give in that offering, we're saying, I want other people to know what I know about Jesus. I want other people to be saved and healed and delivered and know the liberty and have an incredible future. That's why you give in the, in the, in the offering. We honor God. We honor God to reach people. We give to God through the church to reach the world. So thank you for being so generous and so giving in this church. Thirdly, our third focus, we need to focus on the word. We need to begin to focus on other people because I tend to be me focused. And thirdly, Colossians 3, 2. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. It become more eternity focused. You know, when you realize that God is using this time, this life, He is using this time to prepare you for eternity. Do you realize that? This is all training. This is all clipping. This is gonna this is gonna be over, it could be over the blink of an eyelash. Even if you live to be two hundred compared to eternity, that's a joke. Life is so short. This is a time where we are learning, where God is preparing us for what our calling is going to be in eternity. This is like we're going to elementary school or secondary school or whatever. You know, you go to school or you go to college or whatever. It teaches you something to do something in life. This life is preparing us for eternity. But my focus, I'm always thinking about now and how can I, how can I live comfortably now and how can I 
how can I be happy? And God says, Rick, I want you to be holy, not happy. <laughs> Thank God it's okay to be happy, but God wants us to be holy, be holy people. So we need to begin to think about, that's when I give an offering, I'm thinking about eternity. I want to reach people. I, all these things that I have, no matter how much I've got, I'm not taking any with me. The only thing I can take with me is people. People are, are going to last three hours forever, somewhere. Not everybody goes to heaven, you know that? It's sober, not everybody goes to heaven. So we need to focus on eternal things. All right, we're going to end up today with a uh, story in the Bible, true story about Abraham, and I call it Seven Keys, and uh, hopefully you got a little insert in your bulletin. There's going to be some fill in the blanks for you to help you to keep you focused on the message. But uh, we're going to look at seven principles in terms of hearing God's voice. In the life of Abraham, Abraham is a famous believer. He's called a friend of God. I mean, that's, that's, a, great, that's a great testament to call, to call a friend of God. Especially when God calls you that, it's like, whoa, God said that about you. Remember, one word, one word from God can change your life. One word from God. One word from God today can change your life. Give you new direction, new focus, new hope, new purpose. God's speaking today, but we need to set our hearts to hear. Let's just pause for a moment before we get into the story of Genesis. I'd like us to pause to pray again. I don't think you can pray too much. Do you guys think you can pray too much? I, I don't think you can, right? You can't overpray, can we? Because when we pray, we're acknowledging God, that He's Lord. And you know what, really? I'd like to challenge you with this. When you spend time praying to God, whenever that is, morning, noon, or night, wherever you have time to pray, prayer is really more about me hearing what God is saying than me giving God a bunch of do's and don'ts. God, here's your list today. I want you to bless, you know, I'm glad, help Aunt Edna, and help, you know, my cousin, and bless me in my work. And You know, there's okay, it's okay asking God for things. Jesus said we're to ask. He said to ask, seek, and knock. It's okay. But prayer is more about me getting together with God and hearing what He says. Because you know what? Every time Jesus prayed for somebody, they got healed every single time because he heard perfectly. But there were times we went by a whole area with a bunch of sick people and we prayed for one person. Because we you know why? Because the Holy Spirit didn't tell them to pray for everybody. He said, pray for that one. So prayer time is more about me hearing what is God saying than me giving God a bunch of do's and don'ts for the day. Well, Father, we just pause again to pray and acknowledge, Lord, the Bible says that you're the one that opens up the ears to hear. Holy Spirit, come. Open up our hearts. Lord, my own feeble way, I pray that you use me to minister your word to people here today. There's people that, are, that desperately need to hear from you, God. That desperate, there's, there's some desperation in the hearts of people today. God, you are here with us. Open up our ears. Holy Spirit, come and do your work. We love you and thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to continually remind ourselves to put our faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, will start out. It's a very famous uh, story. It's about Abraham taking his son to, to sacrifice him to God. It's one of those perplexing stories of Abraham. How did you do that? How could you? How did he do that? How did he do that? Anyway, Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, pick it up there. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's face. Abraham, God called. Yes, he said, here I am. Your first fill the blank there. We are tested. We are tested by how we respond to God's voice. I, I did, I've done a lot of school in my life, a lot, a lot of school, past high school, and uh, take a lot of tests. And you know what? When I took, when, when we took tests in school, the test was really for the teacher to find out if we knew the material. That's what it was. There, you know, I've, I've taught you all this, now let's take a test see if you can learn it. When God gives you and I a test, the test isn't for God. He already knows. He knows what I know. He knows what I don't know. You know, God is omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's everywhere. He's all powerful. The test isn't for God. It's for you. It's for me. The test is, I find out. You ever get in a situation and you say, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I didn't do that. 
we get surprised at how we respond sometimes because when the pressure's on, I might think I'm Joe Holy, <laughs> Joe Christian, but when the pressure's on, I realize, wow, I didn't do so well. Maybe I'm not as mature as I thought I was. So we're tested how we respond to God's voice. And a test, when God gives us something that reveals our character. You know, will we do what God asks us to do? Some of us here would say are probably a little stymied in our walk with God. And we want to hear from God. And you know what? The last thing God told you to do, you didn't do it. And he's probably going to remind some people today that, hey, do you remember when I, I spoke to you about doing this? Or maybe not doing that anymore? <coughs> he's probably not going to speak to us again until I do the first thing. Why would he, you know, why would he give me more responsibility if I didn't, if I didn't do the first thing? Continue on in verse 2, Genesis 22, verse 2. Here's what God says. says, Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. Not you, is there something in your life that you love so much? You love it more than you love God? You know what God does when I have something in my life like that? He begins to put his finger on that thing. He says, I want that. Because God's greedy? No. Just because God needs it? No. But he knows if he allows that to stay in my life, God won't be first. And it's going to eventually hurt me. It can be a person. It can be a job. Career, hobby. It can be money. But anything I put before God, if I'm seeking after God, eventually he's going to put his, hand, he's going to put his finger on that. He's telling Abraham, take your son, your son who you love so much. See, Isaac reflected the promise that God gave to Abraham. And he takes that out, the promise is going to come to pass. Sometimes we have dreams in life, and sometimes God has to allow that dream to die for us to realize that only God can make it come to pass. I can't make my dream come true. Only God can do that. So sometimes the dream has to die. He says, and go to the land of Moriah, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Second point, second key. God doesn't give us all the information. We walk by faith. Faith is your fill in the blank there. Faith. We walk by faith. Second Corinthians 5 says that we walk by faith, not by sight. You know what? I like to walk by sight. <laughs> I want to see it. I, 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 sometimes I tell God, I'm, I'm, I'm from Missouri. Show me, God. <laughs> Show me before I step out of faith. Show me before I give this money that you're going to bless me. Show me. Give me the money first, then I'll give it back to you. God said, no, give me the money first. You make this decision, but you step out of faith first. See, my natural, I don't like that. I, I want to see. That's a very natural response. But we have to, see, God, God didn't tell him what, which mountain. He said, just go tomorrow one of those mountains. I'll tell you when you get there. God's sort of like a GPS, you know, like a Garmin, Tom Tom, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It tells you the next step. Okay, turn right here, but it doesn't give me the whole, I'm, sometimes I want to push the button, I want to know, the whole, I want to know all the turns, you know, and then, then I get, I'm messing up driving, and it just, it just gives me, my GPS just gives me the next turn. Sometimes God only gives you and I the next turn, he doesn't tell us the whole thing. Sometimes he'll tell us to make this turn, we're going along, and I haven't heard anything for a while. Am I, am I, I just wish the government would say, hey man, you are right on, you're right on track, you're right, you're right where you should be, don't worry about it, don't sweat it. It doesn't say anything. Kind of irritating. Until the, until the last moment when I need to hear, then tell me turn left and right. You know what? Sometimes I miss it. You ever have that? You go along, all of a sudden you're recalculating. It's like, ah, oh, oh, recalculate. That means I missed the turn, you know? I'll say turn right, turn right. But that's a code word for making a U turn because you're going the wrong way. You know? It's like trying to be polite about it. <laughs> you know what? God, same thing. We make wrong turns all the time. God says, okay, recalculate. We can take the next, take the next level. We can get you back on track. There's no plan B against plan A. God has plan A for your life. You get off on track. He'll get you, if you just keep listening, he'll get you back on track. Because there's only no plan A for your life. And he's made allowances for our, you know, that's why you keep extra gas in your tank. Because you, you know, you make, God has extra gas in the tank for you when you make a wrong, he knows you're going to make wrong turns. King David made some wrong turns. You know, God got him back on track. 
So we have to walk by faith that God doesn't give us. He doesn't always, he isn't talking to us all the time. He doesn't continue to be talking to us when we need to hear from him. Verse 3 of Genesis 22. The next morning, Abraham got up early and sat on his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. And he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. See, the third principle, we need other people. People's going to find there. We need other people to help us on our journey with God. God sends other people in our lives. They'll put people in strategic places. Give you favor. They'll give you instruction. God will speak through other, through other people. He'll speak through circumstances. God is not limited to a voice in my mind. That's the predominant way. Spontaneous stuff. That's the predominant way that God will speak to you and I. But that's not the only way. I could be reading the Word. I can get a phone call from somebody. Uh, I can be at you know, Walmart and someone comes up and says, oh, God can use people to help us. And he'll put people in our lives to help us. And sometimes we get so focused on the destination and on the trip, and we forget it's the journey, it's the walk with God where he's trying to teach us things and show us things. But I'm so consumed, and I'm kind of a goal person. I'm always, I've got to get there. i got to get, you know, i got to get it. And I don't sometimes stop and smell the roses along the way. You've got to enjoy life, enjoy the journey, enjoy what God's teaching you. Along the way. Fourth principle, Genesis 22, verses 4 and 5. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. So the same people that God was using to help Abraham, now he's telling him, stay here. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and we will come back to you. Fourth principle, fourth key. Some relationships you have to leave behind. Some relationships you have to leave behind. To go on with God, there will be times when you have to be willing to let go of some relationships. That can be hard. If you have a good friend, and uh, find out not everybody wants to hear from God. Not everybody wants to walk with God. And sometimes you begin to get hungry for God, and people around you get a little nervous. They'll start to feel guilty. Uh, or they'll say, you know, why, why are you going to church so much? Why are you, why are you reading your Bible so much? Why are you praying so much? Or, you know, why are you going to these conferences so much? And isn't that a little excessive? Can you be excessive about God? I mean, there's all kinds of weird people doing weird things, but there aren't too many people that have too much of God in their life. I haven't run into too many of those. I wish that was said about me. He's got he's too much about God. He's just all he ever talks about Jesus and prayer and heaven and I want people to get saved. And some people don't want to grow. When you begin to grow, they'll get sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's moms and dads, sometimes it's brothers and sisters, sometimes it's your children. Sometimes you have to let relationships go. Because sometimes God wants you to spend time with him by himself. Moses had to go spend 40 years on the backside of the desert. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness by himself. Paul went for three years after he had say, went to Damascus, three years in the desert. Uh, you know, Apostle Paul, he was in jail a few times, talking about how everybody left him. Apostle John wrote this great book of Revelation while he was on Patmos. He was exiled there. That was, a, that was a penal colony he was in. Sometimes God has to get you and I away. God took a woman named Ruth out of her, her whole culture, her whole country. Can you imagine if God just told you today, hey, uh, you're going to Lithuania. You know that? You're just going to move and go to Lithuania. That'd be, that'd be a real breath of fresh air. Wouldn't, wouldn't you love a word like that? You leave all your family behind, everything that you know, your culture, leave it all behind. Yeah. Sometimes God calls us to do that. Sometimes God has to get us away from other people to hear his voice. Because there's other people that are in our ear. And they try to dominate us. And I know probably nobody in here is like this or has ever been like this. But I've had some people that try to, try to dominate my life and tell, try to tell me what to do. Has anybody ever, ever had anybody like that? Yeah, there's some people out there. Yeah, well meaning. Those of you that are strong, deep personalities, you know what? There ain't nothing better 
a healthy D personality. So if you're a D personality, a driver, dominant person, if you're healthy in Jesus, nothing better than a D that's healthy. But when they're unhealthy, who, baby? Controlling, manipulating. You can say that about all the personalities. I don't know if you guys have been through the DISC, all those, all those personalities. When they're healthy, they're great. You know, I person, you know, I person's all excited about life, about people, and like me about themselves, you know. They're the kind of person who gets together with you, and for the first 45 minutes, you're, you're meeting with them, they're talking about themselves, what they're doing, what their life is, how their life's going on, and they're just excited about life, and they're just keep talking about themselves, and they sit there, and finally they stop, and they go, man, I've been talking all about me all this time. This whole 45 minutes, it's been all about me. Well, what do you think about me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Know somebody like that? Maybe some of us will like that. It's okay. That's a great personality. The eye. We need help. We need to be a healthy eyes. We need people that are like the party. You know, we need those kind of people to stir things up. But if they're unhealthy, it's all about them all the time. And pretty soon you think, next time they call you up and go, you know, I'm not doing lunch for the next three years. Okay, I'm fasting lunch, so I can't get together. <laughs> Fifth principle, Genesis 22, verse 6 through 8. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them walked on together. Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but um, where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Verse 8, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. Fifth principle, God makes provision. God makes provision, even when we don't see it. Sometimes, God allows circumstances, difficulties. There are some of you here today, you're, you're going through a crisis. It could be with your health, it could be with a family member, it could be with your spouse. There's some kind of crisis going on. Maybe people around you know about it, they're praying about it. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've never shared the situation with somebody. You're, you're facing a personal crisis in your life. God is using that to drive you to himself. Again, God's a good God. God's a loving God. But he knows exactly what we need. And I tend to want to be comfortable and secure. You know how much our country spends on security? You know, from 9-11, you know how much money we're spending on it because our culture values security. And I don't like being insecure. I don't like being whatever. But boy, we value as people. I want to know. I want to be safe. I want to be secure all the time. Sometimes God says, you've got to trust me. I think times are coming for our nation. We're going to have to, have to rely upon God. Our government can only do so much. We've got to rely upon God. So God allows difficulties or problems to make us dependent, to make us develop that inner ear to hear what is God saying to me. Next verse, Genesis chapter 22, verses 9 through 11. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife and killed his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Sixth principle, we need to know what God is saying to us now. Now. We have to constantly, continually be listening for God's voice. Abraham had heard God correctly. But what is God saying now? Some of us are doing something that God told us five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. And you heard, and you, that was right on. But what is he saying today? What is he saying today? <clears throat> he wants us to be continually listening for his voice. Because if I'm not continually listening to God's voice, my relationship with God will die and shrivel up. If I continue to live off a revelation I have from God, 
Some of you may just say, you know, 40 years ago I got saved and Jesus is my Lord. I've been serving him. But what is he saying to you today? Christians shrivel up and die in their relationship with God. Churches shrivel up and die in their relationship with God. Denominations shrivel up. Go look at Europe. Lots of pretty empty cathedrals. Things that God did hundreds of years ago. But it became religion. It became organized religion. There's no perfect denomination. There's no perfect church. There's no perfect Christian. We need to constantly hear what God is saying. I'll bet Isaac was sure glad his dad was still hearing the voice of God. Huh? Abraham was probably glad. Uh-huh. He's probably saying, I'm glad I heard that. Mm -hmm. well, we need a fresh... What's God saying to you today? You know, the children of Israel in the desert, remember in Exodus, they're out trudging along and God provides for them manna. And they had to go out and get fresh manna every single day. God even warned them, he says, do not get too much and try to keep leftovers for the next day. And not everybody listened, did they? And so that it, it went bad, it smelled, and it developed maggots, maggots because they tried to, when God told them, every day collect what you need. Every day, you and I need a fresh word from God. Thank God what God may have spoke to you or I last year, five years ago. Thank God for that. But what is he saying today? You need to hear God's voice today. What's the now word from God today? Number 7, Genesis 22, verses 12 and 13. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him anyway, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Verse 13. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Last principle. Whatever difficulty life presents to us, God has a solution. God's got a solution. It may look like what's in front of you is a, is a mountain. It's like there's no, there's no way out of this. There's no way I can see. I can't, I can't figure my way. I can't do it. God has a solution. A lot of times it's that way because we realize if, if it isn't God, it's not going to happen. I can't make it happen. I need God. Because Jesus told us that if the enemy puts a mountain in front of us, we can speak to that mountain and tell it to cast itself into the sea. Now what happens sometimes is we do the wrong thing. We miss God, and we create mountains in our lives. You ever done something or maybe neglected something? All of a sudden, now I've got a serious problem. It could be with your car. It could be with your house. It could be with your relationship. It could be with your health. That you knew you should be doing something, or you knew you should be doing something, and you didn't do it. You did what you weren't supposed to do. And now i got a mountain in my life that I created. God will still help me, but you know what? I created that mountain. I'm going to dig my way out. God will help me if I let him. But I can speak to that mountain. I can preach to that mountain. I can yell and scream at that mountain. And it ain't going anywhere because I created that mountain. The devil puts a mountain in our lives. We can speak to it. We create a mountain. We've got to dig it out. If God puts a mountain in front of us. We have to climb that mountain. Many things, many spiritual things happen on mountains. Men of God, Jesus spent a lot of time praying on mountains. A lot of time praying on mountains. But you know what? While Abraham was climbing up one side of this mountain with a terrible problem in the back of his mind, God was already sending that, that ram up the other side. He was already making provision for him. He already had a solution to the problem. Sometimes you and I get shocked when things happen in our lives. We're just, I, I didn't see that coming. I couldn't, I just can't believe that happened. But nothing surprises God. Isn't that good news? Nothing will ever catch God off guard. He'll never say, wow, even I missed that one. No, he'll never say that. He sees it and he's made provision if we'll turn to him, put our trust in him. Today we're going to close with prayer. And uh, I think there's some people here today that God is challenging you with some of the old thinking that we need to change the way we think.
about God, about our lives, about our calling. Some of us are just real honest. My, my thought life is kind of out of control. I'm thinking about things I shouldn't be thinking. I've got this situation. I still haven't forgiven that person. I'm just keep thinking about it. And God wants to help them today to set free from that whole way of thinking. Focusing on things. Some of us, our focus is wrong. We just got, we got distracted. There's a whole lot of distractions in our culture today that we've gotten our focus off of what we need. Because there's just so much stuff that's that's challenging you, that's trying to get your attention. You know, our, our, our TVs and internets and our phones and everything, they're just constant. There's a constant battle in our lives. You know, advertisement and sell, sell, sell. They're just always, everybody's trying to get our focus on the wrong thing. And some of us today, probably have some wrong relationships. We have some people in our lives that we're allowing to speak into our lives, and they don't have the best of our best interest at heart. God's telling you to walk away from that relationship. You know, some of you may be parents here, maybe your, your daughter's got a boyfriend, and you're thinking, mm -mm, he is not the right one, that's not a good, uh, mm -hmm. some of you may have a son, he's hanging around a young lady, and mm -mm, she's just a bad influence, she's just whatever. Sometimes we have to get rid of some wrong relationships. Some of us, we just need to develop our faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And for hearing, we have to hear God's Word. Well, I'd like to pray for anyone that Jan has been placed on the piano and on for a time to pray. But I also feel like today, specifically, I felt like God said today that I am to pray for the sick. If you've got some type of a physical situation. Uh, going on in your body, you may say, you know, I've been praying about that for years. I've had so many people pray for me, and I know, I know. But he may be saying today is the day. He may be saying today, I want you to get prayer, and I'm going to touch your life. And to remind you that when healing comes, typically, when we pray in faith for healing, healing is a process. We love it when we get prayed for. Pray for somebody and they get the healing right away. And really the Bible calls that's a miracle. Thank God for that. I'll take the miracles too. But healing is a process. You know, Jesus prayed for, for people, prayed for the lepers, and said as they went, as they went, they were healed. There was a blind guy and he put mud on him and told him, go wash. Why didn't Jesus just do this? Hey, the, you know, eyes come out, pop out, and he could do that. But there was a process there. So I want to give an opportunity. I just want to be obedient. I like to pray. I have some anointing. I'm going to anoint. The Bible says, you know, to call the elders and to anoint with oil. God heals that way. God says these signs will follow those that believe they'll lay hands on the sick. And they will recover immediately. <coughs> does it say it that way? No, it just says they'll recover, right? So if you have a physical condition today, I'm, I'd like to pray for you. And we're just going to agree that God's going to hear the prayer and the deep healing. And if it comes right now, you and I will dance around the auditorium together. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. But healing is a process, and we're going to believe for healing. So would you stand with me as we prepare to dismiss? If there's anything here today that I talked about that you want someone to agree with you about your thought life, uh, about your future, um, about the, the a relationship that's hindering you, I'd like to pray in agreement with you. And also, if there's anyone today you have a physical need you would like to be prayed for, I just feel like there's many times the Bible says the presence of the Lord is there to heal. And so we're just going to obey God's word. So I'm just going to invite you to come forward. We're going to pray in faith. We're just going to believe God that He's here.